Good morning. Good morning. Would you state your name and spell your last name for the record? I'm Greg, G-R-E-G, Hampikian, H-A-M as in Mary, P as in Peter, I-K-I-A-N as in Nancy. Okay. And and it's uh, Dr. Hampikian, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, um, in full disclosure, we do know each other, don't we? Uh, from this case, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, how would you prefer, for purposes of this hearing, that I address you as either your your first name or was Dr. Hampikian what you would prefer? Uh, pr probably given the formality, Dr. Hampikian is okay. what I'm used to. So, Dr. Hampikian, can you can you briefly explain to me um, your occupation? I'm a professor at Boise State University. I have a laboratory there. We work on a lot of DNA projects, forensics, viruses, um, uh, cancer. And um, I have a joint appointment. Uh, so I'm in the biology department, but I have a joint appointment in criminal justice so that I can uh, take on some of their students for projects, uh, occasionally lecture over there. And then I'm an adjunct uh, lecturer at the University of Idaho uh, College of Law, and then I uh, also consult on uh, cases like this, which uh, are private cases, and uh, I head up something called the Forensic Justice Project that deals with uh, testing DNA in uh, cases where uh, people write in and say they're innocent, they've been convicted wrongfully. And in that regard, with your forensics project, is that a nationally renowned project or organization? It's it's uh, it's funded nationally. We work right now in I think a dozen states, and uh, we have a grant from the Department of Justice. They don't endorse anything I say. I always have to say that about my funding agencies. Uh, to work in five states in particular, uh, doing uh, DNA reviews of cases. Okay, and there's no particular uh, distinction. You will do work for. Uh, defense work and you will do work for prosecution work. Is that fair? Sure. Yes. And have you testified previously in cases regarding DNA analysis? Yes. Um, yeah. Dozens of times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And can you briefly explain to me your educational background? I have a PhD in genetics, a bachelor's in biology, a master's in genetics, all from the university of Connecticut and stores. Uh, I've had postdoctoral training after that um, on a National Science Foundation uh, grant in Australia, working on the Y chromosome, the male chromosome, and then uh, more postdoctoral training in Massachusetts in uh, developmental biology and a lot of professional development around forensics. And that's mostly done through the American Academy of Forensic Sciences or some of our annual meetings. Is there any special accreditation or, 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 or academic uh, uh, achievements that are recognized as part of your, your time doing DNA analysis? Uh, I, you know, I mean, the most important things are our publications. That's what we're judged by. So these are sent out for peer review. If two of the three editors think it's good, we might have to fix a few things and then it gets published. Uh, but I, I consider that the most important thing. And then um, we have uh, uh, certifications to put uh, DNA in certain databases. There's a Y chromosome database. Uh, of course, I have tenure at the university, which is another hoop. So there's lots, lots of hoops okay. we had to go through. And this is not, uh, th this is Boise, Idaho that we're in, but you're an international, um, um, uh, you're, you're, um, you're sought after in an international international capacity. Would that be fair? I don't Objection know. Objection. Thought after. <laughs> bolstering the witness. All right. First of all, Ken, I'll be talking at the same time to keep a clear record. When there's an objection made, please pause so the court can roll, and the court is going to sustain that objection. Okay. Have you had an occasion to work with international police? Yes. Uh, I've worked with the French police. My mother lived in France at the end of her life, and uh, uh, I had good relations with them. We actually published a case that we worked on. It was a, a big national case that had languished for many years. It was the first time that uh, a type of DNA familial searching was used. So we published an article 
And I've worked uh, with the Taiwan uh, Forensic Science Lab. And we also published a case, and that was a man who was wrongfully convicted with DNA analysis that we asked to review. And um, the lab did the, the laboratory wet work at our request. And then we wrote a report together and then published an article. So not only is your your organization do your own DNA analysis, you peer review others as well. Would that be fair? Yeah. Right now, most of the work is review. It comes in on computer disks. So it's run uh, at independent accredited forensic labs, mostly in America, a few a few international cases. You mentioned the French case. Would would that have been the Amanda Knox case? No, Amanda was in Italy, and That's that right. was um, yeah, that was a, a different case. The French case was Elodie Kulik. Did you have any involvement in the Amanda Knox case? I did have some involvement in that case. I worked on it uh, for several years with the defense side, uh, starting during the original trial where she was convicted and then uh, staying with it through to her ultimate exoneration. And when you say ultimate exoneration, eventually she was, uh, through part of your efforts with DNA, she was exonerated of the charges. Is that right? Yes. Objection, Your Honor, bolstering the witness. Oh, oh hold on. There's an objection. I'm sustaining the objection, striking any answer that came okay. after. About how many cases... Um, well, before we get to that, about how long have you been doing this forensic DNA work? Since uh, about 1989. Okay. And about how many cases have you worked on? Uh, you know, work is a, some of these cases take years and years of a lot of work and, and some of them are just quick reviews, but I'm, I'm sure I'm in the hundreds by now. Okay. And you already mentioned that you uh, publish your work in peer reviewed, uh, uh, journals is that correct yes that's required really of uh, the academic position and and required of the, of the acad as part of uh, being affiliated in some capacity with boise state i they generally don't let you stay if you're not publishing yeah okay. and then i think i mentioned this before but i'll i'll mention it again you you do work with the police on these cases as well is that correct yes uh, particularly in cases where the state labs uh, don't have the technology and we have have the technology or they uh, haven't yet validated the te technology and and uh, we can help the police. And a lot of what I'd call difficult DNA cases where they're over 20 years old, say, and uh, we're reopening them. So we, we have a lot of uh, officers come to the lab. You mentioned that, and that was where I was leading next, is there are instances where our own state lab doesn't have the facilities or the understanding to engage in certain testing that you have. Is that correct? I wouldn't say they don't have the understanding, uh, uh, but they they have a very difficult process. They have to validate, you may have heard from their experts, uh, all of the techniques. I mean, it's a public lab. And so we're a research lab. We can kind of get to the newer technology more easily. And uh, that's really the reason why I think people would come to us. Okay. And um, you have testified in regards to the helping the prosecution in cases as well. Is that correct? I've been listed as a witness here in Idaho, didn't testify. Uh, I did testify in Atlanta, Georgia, and was uh, paid by the uh, Fulton County to testify as part of your i'm sorry i'll slow down as part of your um uh, employment is it part of your employment to train students who work in police forensic dna laboratories yes uh i teach the forensic biology course it's the only one at the university and so uh, several of my students have gone on and gotten jobs uh, in forensic science in the laboratories. I have a graduate student who uh, works in one of the um, uh, with one of the police agencies right now. So a lot of people have come through the lab and end up in forensic science, some of them in state labs. And in, as part of your occupation as well, have you had the occasion to uh, instruct and train judges on DNA analysis? 
Um, so judges come a lot of times to the to the professional development that I offer for all lawyers. Uh, but specifically, um, I was invited twice to Montana to train the judges and then once to Israel to train judges. Okay. And has it had the occasion where you have helped solve what are referred to as cold cases? Yes, uh, I'd say the one I referred to in France is a notable example. And then uh, uh, Christopher Tapp, who... Um, was exonerated here in Idaho. We worked with the Idaho Falls Police Department to find a new DNA match who eventually uh, confessed uh, to the crime that Mr. Tapp had served uh, uh, wrongfully for. And uh, there's a case now that's going on in Idaho where we helped the, the police establish a new match in a, a murder that was many decades old. But uh, that's not finished yet. Okay, and so when I make a, uh, uh, when I talk about what is called a cold case, mm -hmm. that means a case that occurred sometime previously. Every, it has several definitions. Uh, I like to think of them as old cases that you know are just not getting a lot of uh, movement forward, and um, some agencies will refer to them as cold cases. And there's actually special funding you can get from the Department of Justice that are aimed at solving these cases. Uh, so there are cases where there's no active suspect and um, uh, methods like genealogy, one of the new methods can be used. Okay. Um, do you have a DNA lab at, 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 um, at your location? Yes. And is that a fully functioning DNA, DNA lab? <laughs> on, on good days, it's fully functioning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a uh, you know it has the equipment that um, that's similar to the forensic equipment that the Idaho State Police Lab has. Uh, we're not doing active casework though. I send any evidence now to uh, accredited independent labs, either the state lab or an uh, independent lab, uh, uh, and that's mostly because I don't want everybody in the lab to get subpoenaed to to come and work like something like this. And uh, it's just easier. So for, you know, uh, for somebody writing a check, they can take all the responsibility for uh, everything that happens, handling wet lab items. You mentioned the state lab. Has there been occasions when the state lab has reached out to you, to the Idaho State Lab has reached out to you to consult you on issues? I don't think the state labs reached out to me. We've, we've talked, and I certainly know some of the analysts, but I, I can't remember them okay. uh, reaching out to me. And you do teach forensic courses as well at Boise State? I teach forensic biology at the law school. I teach uh, a course called Wrongful Convictions that looks at how we reopen cases with, with DNA. So that's kind of a forensics class. And uh, periodically, I'll teach seminars on forensics. And would you? how often would you say that you testify? Um, you know, five, six times a year, maybe, or less. Okay. Is there a reason or an understanding as to why you don't testify more often? I mean, most times if I review a case, I'm getting a bunch of data and I can run it through our software and, and check on things. And I go through all the records. And if I'm not contributing something new that someone has hired me to look at, they're not probably going to want to pay for more time for me to come and uh, sit in the courtroom. So oftentimes, if I agree with what the lab has done and there's no questions, I'm not called to testify. And that's probably, that's the vast majority of cases. I'd and, say. and would you describe your profession as a specialized scientific profession? Yes. And it takes specialized knowledge? Yes. And with your education and training, are there a number of people who obtain your or have your specialized knowledge in this field? I mean, I get to meet with my colleagues. I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. There's a few few thousand people there, uh, and uh, and then I'm I mean, I'm going to another professional meeting in June, different one, and there'll be a few hundred people there. Hopefully, when I get to to speak as well. And you're speaking there. Yeah. Are there any special certifications that are required to do what you do? 
certifications. I mean, I have to, anytime we do anything at the university, there's two oversight boards that we have to apply to. They have questions about, about our methodology in terms of humans. Like, is, are we compromising anybody's rights? Are we doing any experiments that would, uh, you know, abuse somebody in some way or abuse their rights? And then I have to go through the, um, the biology uh, safety committee and they also review everything. And then every year we have to go through all of our training again to be certified uh, to continue the research. So, And in order to do what you do, it's important that you maintain those certifications and training. Is that correct? Me and everybody in my lab, yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about a concept of transferring DNA. Can you, in, in general, give me a, a broad overview of what the concept of transfer of DNA means. So transfer is really at the center of DNA. Um, you would probably heard of you know, latent print evidence. It's very hard to transfer somebody's thumbprint from you know, your glass to say a weapon, uh, but DNA can move very easily. And so we always have to be cautious about making conclusions about how DNA got somewhere. So I like to say DNA is really good at telling us something about who may have contributed, but the how it got there, that's really for the triers of fact, for the jury or the judge. And DNA, as a DNA analyst, I can't tell. And the reason I can't tell is because DNA does move. Uh, it's, it's how we get it. We take a swab, it just is a Q-tip, you wet it and you rub it on something. And then you take a dry swab and you rub it. And both of those, just like you might clean up a pudding stain or something from a kid on a cloth, you know, you transfer some of that material to your swab, so wet swab and a dry swab. And then you have to get that material off the swab and it's as easy as putting it in water with a few chemicals and the DNA comes off. So DNA moves around uh, all the time. When we talk about touch DNA, a term I really don't like because it implies we know how it got somewhere someone touched with their hand, but really the the way we get DNA on our hands, what the what the research shows is you touch your face, you know, you're washing your hands during the day, but you touch parts of your body, you know, you might scratch your ear, whatever. And all of those loose cells are transferred to your hands. So even what we call touch DNA is mostly transferred from somewhere else. So uh, that's why I'm very cautious about speculating how DNA got anywhere. I don't know any better than anyone with common sense how DNA got somewhere. It's who could have contributed it. Okay. So it's an issue of who contributed as to how it actually got there. For me, yes. That's what I think is the limits of my ability. And the fluidity of DNA, uh, it can, there's a number of manners in which DNA can be transferred. Is that correct? Um, yeah. I mean, we talked about touch and swabbing with a liquid. You could just sweat and some of those cells would roll down with the sweat. So all, all the ways you can imagine dust, say, moving, DNA can move. So you just mentioned that, that the manner in which dust can move, would that be the same manner in which DNA can move? If it's dry and flaky, but DNA can also be in liquids. So yeah, it's a, a it has a variety of ways of transferring. So my touching of this microphone... Mm -hmm. Potentially, I could have placed my DNA on the, 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 the speaker of this. Likely you did, whether it would be detected with a single swab or not. You know, I don't know. But yeah, we, uh, on contact, our shells, our, our cells, sorry, are shedding all the time. So on contact, you're probably leaving a few. So when you say something as likely as touching something, um, if you were to have any kind of contact with any particular item, is there a high likelihood or a good likelihood that that DNA would be transferred to that item? Several levels to that question. You know, how much, how, when did I wash my hands? How, how long did I touch it? How vigorously am I a shedder? Do I have psoriasis or dandruff? Uh, and so there's a lot of questions just about me and my contact with something or a person's contact. But then there's also the laboratory, what technique they're using in my lab, we can detect down to a single cell, not 100% of the time, maybe 20% of the time or so, where we 
can get DNA from a single cell if we want to. And I'm going to jump around a little bit before mm -hmm. I get back to the single cell yeah. uh, analysis. Uh, DNA and the transfer of DNA can be in relation to how much friction is involved with the surfaces. Would that be fair? Yes. And talk a little bit about that. Um, just like when you want to rub something off your body or uh, exfoliate, uh, uh, the more rubbing, obviously, the more raw you're going to make the skin. And the first thing that comes off is just the outer layer. That's uh, all the dried uh, keratinocytes. They kind of link together and they give you waterproofing. So that first layer goes. But if you keep scrubbing, you know, you'll get down to, to tissue. You'll get tissue fluid and then you'll get blood and you'll get other bits of tissue. So it de depends how vigorous uh, in terms of how many, how far down you go, how many layers, and then also just the the amount of friction. Just like you'd imagine, if you're filing your nails, more friction, more removal of biological material. For those of us that don't have your um, significant knowledge in this area, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about this concept of what, and if you could put it into some context, what is a single cell? Oh. Um... It's very small. You, you, you can't see it uh, unless it's a, a human egg cell. You can actually see they're big enough to see. But the type of cells we're talking about, the epithelial cell, you have to have a microscope to see. Uh, and so you can transfer hundreds. Uh, or I'm told we transfer pounds of these skin cells. So we're leaving a lot of them and they're very small. So our, and that, and you're leading into my next question because no. you can analyze down to a very minute uh, cell that only can be detected with a microscope. Is that correct? Yes. But as, as humans, would it be fair to suggest that we are in a constant process of shedding a skin and our DNA at, at all times of the day? Yes. So in all likelihood, as I walk around, and if I'm shedding, my DNA is being placed all over this table, right? Yes. And even if I go to sit down in that chair, as a human, and the fact that we are human beings that are in a constant state of shedding, would my DNA also be transferred to that chair by sitting down on it? It could, or if somebody else's DNA is on your pants because you sat somewhere where they, you know, had their hand down, you could transfer someone else's. As well. And in addition, if you were to pick up or hold an object of any kind, there'd be a high likelihood, a good likelihood. Is there any way to determine what the likelihood is of how your DNA and what DNA would be on that item that you would pick up? In a laboratory setting, there's studies that are done. We've done them in my lab where, you know, you hold something quickly, you grab it and you uh, uh, rub it. Uh, we tried a bunch of different things. And I, I think it's kind of common sense about the, the trends, the more friction, the more time, the more transfer, but there are shocking things. Sometimes somebody handles something a lot and you get no DNA. Sometimes somebody just taps it and you get tons of DNA. So I don't, I don't know how to ascribe a likelihood in a, you know, crime situation or a field situation. Just those general rules about time and friction are important. So if I understand your testimony correctly, uh, there are a number of ways to transfer DNA onto an object. Would that be fair? Yes. There would be ways in which you would touch an item and physically have contact with it. That's one way, correct? Correct. There would be a suggestion that if you were just around the object and you were, like many humans, shedding your cells, your cells would naturally fall on or be present on anything that you might be around. They could. Mm -hmm. Your hair can fall out and uh, uh, be on uh, um, something if you were to do that as well, just being in the vicinity. Yes, uh, common sense would. would uh, or if you were doing something rigorous or doing something in the form of an exercise and some of your hair comes out and falls, mm -hmm. that's another way to track DNA. Yeah, the hair is shedding like the skin and uh, just more obviously. So and if you're around something, there is a strong likelihood that your hair is shedding and then you're putting your DNA, again, I could be putting my DNA on that chair by shedding, correct? You could. And if we looked for what we call environmental DNA, I'm sure all of us who've been in this room uh, you know, have a high likelihood of showing up if the room is sampled really well. And aside from 
DNA that falls off of your hair and falls off of our shedding bodies and skin, uh, is there possible that DNA could also be transferred through our breath? Um, you know, there have been studies that show that, and now they're having like swabs outside of zoos and they're detecting all the animals who live in the zoo. So there is a, a, a certain amount of DNA that is transferred in the air. Uh, and that's really an area that people are developing right now. Okay. So in other words, the breathing on, on some object, uh, I'm not talking about any other fluids. Let's, we'll get to that in a second, but the breathing on an object, or if you're involved in a, a situation where you're engaging in heavy exertion, and as part of that heavy exertion, you're breathing onto an object, potentially there would be DNA of you on that as well, correct? Potentially, yes. Okay. And then we'll go to fluids. Mm -hmm. We can get DNA by way of um, um, perspiration, by sweating. Yes. If you're doing some sort of it, um, physical activity yes. and a drop of your sweat were to fall on an object perspiration that would be another way that you would find dna on an object as well is that correct yes. and then by way of spitting uh, as much as as disgusting as it might be uh, all of us have been guilty of being involved in situations where fluid comes out of our mouth and places itself on on dna correct correct and then as far as sneezing or breathing out of our nose, if we have any kind of a cold or any sort of, of, of issue with that, again, that's another way that DNA could be placed on an object. Is that correct? Yes. So would it be fair to say that there are a variety of ways and manners in which DNA can accumulate on any object that you that you are around? Yes. It could be by way of fluid, correct? Correct. It could be by way of air through the air. Yes. It could be by way of hair. Yes. It could be by way of having a physical touch with the, uh, with the object as much, uh, depending on the level of how often you touched it. Correct. Correct. Are there any that I'm missing? Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I mean, I've reviewed all kinds of cases where people weave uh, DNA in a bite mark of a cheese sandwich and a gum wrapper. Uh, you know, there's lots of ways you can, you can think of trying to find. And I always tell people if they say, Hey, can I get DNA off this thing? I'm like, we won't know until we try. Uh, and so uh, I've been surprised we've gotten DNA from bodies that have been submerged in water for days, uh, foreign DNA. And that always surprises me. Uh, you just don't know until you try. So would it be fair to say that, um, uh, there's no real way to take any precautions to prevent your DNA from being placed on anything in particular. Would that be fair? Oh, I think they're action argumentative sustained. Okay. I'll rephrase. In other words, um, DNA has a lot of fluidity. Mo movement wise. Movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of ways and, and manners in which your DNA, whether you mean it or not inadvertently or intentionally can be placed on items with even the most limited amount of contact. Would that be fair? Uh, yes. It's not always the case, but we, you, you test it and you see. Yes. Okay. And judge at this. Yeah. I, I apologize. We do have a request for a break. At this and, point. and judge, I was going to do that. I, I'm going to be getting into an area that I think maybe we would All right. we could take our break. I would ask Dr. Hempinking to please uh, show up again after lunch. Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take the lunch recess at this time. We'll recess from 12 to 1, be back on for additional testimony at 1 o'clock. Thank you. All right, Pete. All right, Mr. Pryor, you may continue. We are back on the record on KCR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. We took the lunch recess. We're back on the record with additional testimony. Dr. Hampikian is on the stand. I'll remind the witness you're still under oath for your testimony. And Mr. Pryor, you may continue with your direct if you wish. You may.
Good afternoon, Dr. Hampingian. Good afternoon. I think where we left off, um, is I was going to start talking up um, the testing procedures that were conducted in this particular uh, group of, uh, of evidence that you were provided. Mm -hmm. um, and before we do that, can you then identify if to the best of your recollection, what evidence you looked at and what did it, it, it did encompass? Um, <clears throat> I was supplied uh, with a number of documents and electronic files. The things that are most important to me are the electronic files with the DNA data, because we have our own software that we can review that through and do probabilities and interpretations from. But I also receive things like, you know, CVs and laboratory records that uh, we review, and then a list of evidence, a lot of which wasn't tested. So I have, you know, there are dozens of items uh, on these lists of evidence and what's uh, most important is the things that were tested. Uh, and so for those, I have reports of the, from three laboratories, a Bodie laboratories, uh, Australia, and the Idaho State Police Forensic Lab. And along with those, we have electronic records that allow us to reanalyze if we need to, uh, if there's any uh, uh, problems. Um, and I can't remember what other documents. There's a okay. there's a large packet of things that come through, but really it's the biological evidence that I pay most attention to. And in regard to the state lab, uh, you were um, uh, you read a report which described a number of hairs on a, a, a piece of adhesive. Do you recall that tape? Yeah, there were a lot, a, a, more than a dozen hairs, as I recall, but a lot of hairs. And do you recall the different colors of those hairs on that adhesive? Brown. There was a uh, very short, dark hair, a blonde hair. Uh, those are the ones I remember. And obviously there were an, a number of the, the dark hairs and I think several of blonde hair. And at some point, the uh, uh, as a result of on that tape and those hairs, and you said over a dozen hairs on that tape? I, I don't know if they were all from that tape, but there are a bunch of hairs listed and only a few went on to testing. So. Okay, and when you say, when you talk about that, the, the state lab is not the agency that's going to test that. Is that correct? Uh, the state lab uh, tests hairs generally when there's a, a root on them, but some of these other tests where there's there's no root, it's just, just the hair shaft. <clears throat> there are labs like Bodie and Estrella, both of the other two labs that will process those and get really good results from hairs without roots. And is it possible to obtain DNA from hairs without roots? Yeah, just about, uh, you know, just a few years ago, three, four years ago, they started advertising this at some of the private labs that that police agencies use like Bodie. And then Estrella is one of the newer companies uh, that specializes in, uh, particularly in hairs that don't have roots. Okay, so as far as Estrella is concerned, the, the only thing that you have in terms of Estrella is that um, of the, um, the brown hairs, the blonde hairs, and the short hair, the brown hairs were sent over for testing to Estrella. Is that what you recall? Not all of them, but for some reason, certain ones were selected. Okay. And uh, as I recall, four test hairs went to Estrella um, and uh their first test is to do a what's called a, a you know a low depth sequencing. So they're basically just going to sequence parts of the three billion bases, not the whole thing. And that's because it's cheaper and it takes less computer time, mm -hmm. and uh, they can then tell you if the hairs are sufficient to go on further. So from that first shallow sequencing that they do, they get uh, what they call a mitochondrial haplotype. They get some information about DNA we get from our mothers. And in that short sequencing, and the first thing they can do, they can tell if if hairs are different from each other. And so they did that with the four hairs. Did they compare those hairs on the ones that they sent to Astria against any, uh, um, and I'm not sure what the proper term is, people or, or um, Re references? Reference, references, I'm sorry, I, I struggled for the word. So there are three references that were sent to Astria, Chad Daybell, uh, Lori Vallow, and JJ. And so those were the only three references that went through the type of testing that Estrella does. So this is a very particular type of testing 
uh, a sequence testing different than what the state lab does currently. Okay. And so they could only compare it to those three samples, the four hairs that they had. They determined from the four hairs that shallow sequencing, that two of the hairs came from possibly the same person. Uh, so they had three different people out of four hairs, and then they compared it to the three references they had. And all of the reference samples were excluded from each of those four hairs that represent three people. So neither Chad Daybell nor Lori Vallow nor, nor JJ contributed those hairs. And then they, uh, there's further analysis than they did, but that's the first main conclusion is there's three different people who don't match the three reference samples who left hairs that were that were sent to Australia. So at this point, what was basically sent to Australia, um, the conclusion is that Chad Daybell was excluded as providing any of the hairs that were provided to Australia as a positive. Would that be fair? Yes. Did you find any evidence of anything that you provided that were provided to you through these DNA reports indicating that Chad Daybell's DNA was present in, on anything? No. I want to talk to you about um, conclusions and, and, you know, what type of conclusions someone in your field of DNA forensics can arrive at. And if you would talk a little bit about that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. In these common types of tests, there's basically three conclusions. I can say someone uh, is excluded. And in other words, there, there's too many mismatches. And I can just say it's clearly not this reference sample that donated DNA to this evidence sample. So that's exclusion. And sometimes a statistic is provided, but it's not required. You can just say they're excluded and show the data. The other uh, option that's informational is that they cannot be excluded. So that means they could have contributed that uh, uh, DNA on the evidence. And then we have to supply a statistic. Is it one out of two people would match it. You know, what's the coincidental match? Is it one out of a hundred trillion? And um, uh, the third option is you can say it's inconclusive. So you can have exclusion, cannot be excluded with a statistic, inconclusive. When is it inconclusive? I drop a tube in lab. Uh, there's nothing in the tube. The test doesn't work. There's there's not, I, I doubt the results somehow. And uh, that that's an inconclusive. So those are the three options that we have. Okay. And then when you get a, a conclusion that it's a negative result, what does that mean? That's a really bad term <laughs> uh, because it means that what's negated is the hypothesis that was being tested. So for example- Explain that to me when mm -hmm. you say what's negated is the hypothesis being tested. Let's say someone is uh, accused of a crime and uh, I swab a handle of a knife, let's say, I have a reference sample from the accused. And really what I'm doing is have hypothesizing that the reference sample matches the evidence sample. And I test that hypothesis. And a negative result means, in, in some ways, the way a lot of analysts use it, means that I've negated that hypothesis. It is not this person. It is an exclusion. So the unfortunate thing is negative result is used when we exclude someone, which is a perfectly valid result. And it's also used when it's inconclusive. Sometimes people say it was a negative result. It, you can think of it like a COVID test or a pregnancy test. You can be negative for the, the pregnancy or the disease, uh, or the test could not work. And some people will sometimes refer to that as negative. There was no evidence. There's no, there's no test. But, um, but in the case of the, the labs, what they're really doing when they have a reference sample, as they have in this case, they had three reference samples, for example, at Estrella, they're testing the hypothesis. Does right, so what test, hypothesis in this case are they testing? Did Lori Vallow contribute uh, the hair? Did Chad Daybell contribute the hair? Did JJ contribute the hair? So they tested three hypotheses. Uh, and in each case, got a negative, a valid, very uh, uh, sensitive and correct answer that none of those people contributed those hairs. So that's that's how negative is used in that in that setting. 
Is it used in other settings as well? Yeah, and like I said, it's a tricky term the way people use it. So I, I uh, sometimes there's a phrase in our field, if I if I can say it, it's that uh, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So you can't prove you weren't somewhere just because they didn't find you there. That sounds like it's true. And I've heard experts like myself say it on the stand. And years ago, I was asked on the stand, isn't it true? The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And then I realized, no, it is the evidence of absence. Of course, it's the evidence. And I know that because in cases where we've done exonerations, there's, there's evidence that other people did the crime. And to say that, you know, just because there's no uh, uh, there's no evidence from an innocent person that that's that that's meaningless. It is meaningful. Things are tested. You test the hypothesis. Narratives. Yeah. Sustained. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So, so again, if I could ask a question. Yeah. Um, the hypothesis you were talking about is is in regards to the absence of evidence and how it relates to um, uh, the testing procedures. Is that correct? Sometimes negative results are referred to as the absence of evidence, and that's incorrect. These are well done, carefully uh, done tests that negate a hypothesis. Did this person contribute? And that's important evidence. Okay. So if I understand you correctly, it's not just showing that his, his DNA or her DNA is not on anything. It's the fact that the hypothesis suggesting that that person in some way contributed to whatever is being tested has been negated and that the hypothesis that that person has been involved in that is negated as well. Objection well, argumentative. Sustained. Is the hypothesis that the person is present is negated by a, a, an absence of evidence? Objection argumentative. Overruled. Um, I, I would I would state it this way that every piece of evidence uh, can be uh, weighed in terms of does it favor one explanation or another, and so when we have a test where someone is excluded, that some people will refer to as negative. When we have a test where someone is excluded, it's up to the triers of fact to decide what hypotheses that favors, but it's evidence when someone is excluded. It's evidence when someone is included. The only thing that's not evidence is the inconclusive. You just forget about that one. But uh, but, but in this positive case, and negative are important conclusions. But in, would it be fair to say that in this particular case, there's an absence of Mr. Daybell's DNA on any of the items that you reviewed? Yes, there's an absence of his evidence, okay. of, his, of his sample, of his DNA. And before we finish up, I would just like to touch on the fact that were the results that you reviewed in this case, were, were, were they valid? Yeah, we check all their controls. And so they, you know, when any time the lab's running a bunch of tests, they have some blank tubes with just the chemicals to make sure nobody's skin cells from the lab or the police got in there or whatever. And so the controls that we, that we uh, use uh, in this case, were standard controls at all three labs, and they all were okay. They were fine controls. So they the follow tests the are trustworthy. They follow the proper testing procedures. They follow the proper procedures, and they got good results with their controls. They searched for the smallest or tiniest amount of DNA? Very small amounts of DNA they searched for. Significantly small? <laughs> I mean, you know, as small as they can go. So generally, we're looking at uh, just a few cells now. So, okay. you know. 20, 40 cells. Is, is there any indication that anything went wrong with their testing procedures? No. And they had all the proper controls? Yes. Now, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about with your familiarity with these testing labs. Do you have some sort of familiarity with Astria? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I know um, uh, Dr. Ed Green, who's helped me on some on, on a particular case. Uh, his technology, I believe, helped found that company. Okay. So I, I helped him with his, I gave him his first case. Really. You gave him his first case? I believe it was, yeah. Okay. It's here in Idaho. Too. And you know Bode Laboratory? I'd been to Bode, Bode many times, or several times, and I uh, I was just on a panel or on a DNA panel with people from Bode, so I know some of those folks who work there. And the state police as well? 
I, I know the state police folks uh, pretty well. I see them at professional meetings. I visited the lab on occasion. Yeah. So there. So if I understand correctly, then you don't have any question about the procedures that they followed. Is that correct? Not in this case, no. What you question is maybe the range of what they decided to test. I don't know who makes those decisions about what's being tested. I just know what ultimately gets tested. And in this case, four hairs were sent to Australia. The short, very short dark hair, it was called. And then the rest of them were brown hairs, three other brown hairs. And then the hairs that weren't sent included blonde hairs. That's correct. Okay. Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Wood, when you're ready, cross-examination. Good afternoon, Dr. Hampton. Good afternoon. So you, you testified, you, you do run a lab at VSU. I do. How, is that a, an accredited forensic laboratory? Not for the type of evidence the state police run, no. Okay. Mr. Wood, I apologize for the interruption. Could I have a quick sidebar with counsel, please? The court wanted to clarify the matter, and I am allowing a brief reopening of the direct in order to address that exhibit, and then we'll go back to cross. So, Mr. Pryor, you may approach. Yes. And this relates to the proposed exhibit 49A. And, Judge, at this time, I'd move, and my understanding is by stipulation to the admission of exhibit 49A. Okay, and that's the Astria report. Does the state have any objection to the admission of Exhibit 49A defense? No objection. Okay, thank you. Exhibit Robert. 49A is admitted. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. I'm done, Judge. Thank you. All right. And sorry on this exhibit again. Do we have a separate 49 and 49A? I believe there's a 49 and there's a 49A, Judge. Okay. Well, 49A is now admitted, which is paper copy of an Astria report. Uh, thank you. Always sort that out. Apologies for the interruption, Mr. Wood. You can commence and begin again or continue where you left off on your cross. Thank you. Dr. Ampeekin? Yes. Hello again. Hi. Uh, so you, you testified, you do run a lab, Yes. uh, but for actual testing in a, in a criminal case, uh, you would send that off to someone else. We do now. Yeah. Uh, was there a time when you tested it? Yes, there was. I, uh, but, and I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you testified this, this lab you run, that was not a forensically, uh, or an accredited forensic lab anymore, or it is not a We never applied for the type of accreditation that Bodie and Estrella and the ISP have had. We use the same procedure, same equipment, but we're an academic lab. And so we don't, we're not required to do that uh, unless we wanted to take in, you know, paid testing, which I, I don't want to do. And you have a lot of students in your lab. Uh, yeah, I think six right now that are okay. this summer. Mr. Pryor spoke with you about uh, the ISP testing. Yes. Uh, and did you review all of the lab reports for that testing? I, I reviewed all I was given. I think I had all the reports, yeah. Okay. Uh, did, you re did you review the test identifying the remains of Tylee Ryan? Yes. And you had no issues with that testing? No. Okay. Did you review the results of the test identifying JJ Vallow? Uh, yes. And and to be to be fair, uh, it identified him to his biological father, Dennis Trahan. Correct. I believe I can't remember, but it was a correct identification. Okay. Yeah. And and you okay? So you didn't have any problem with that testing? None at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, did you review the testing of 
what appeared to be genetic material in the eye of a pickaxe. Yes. And uh, did that testing was was it valid to you? Yes. And, uh, the on that same pickaxe, there was some testing done on what appeared to be a blood spot. Did you review that testing? I believe they referred to it as the ha ha handle or, or yes, yeah, the handle. Yep. And and that testing was fine with you. Yes, it was. Okay. And finally, there was some genetic material on the blade of a shovel. Did you review that testing? Yes. And and that testing was met criteria for you? Yes. And you're aware, uh, you spoke about the Australia lab testing. You were aware of the, the hair that got sent to Bodhi Labs? Yes. And do you remember who that hair was tested against? I, I don't know who it was tested against. I don't remember. It matched Lori Vallow, as I recall. Okay. You wrote a report for this case, correct? Uh, I wrote a, um, a, I don't, I wouldn't call it a report. I wrote what I was going to test, testify to. Okay. Yeah. Your Honor, if I may have one moment. You may. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Again, permission, Judge? Yes, redirect, Mr. Pryor. And just very briefly, Dr. Hampinke, and in regards to the axe and the shovel, mm -hmm. uh, your testimony is that you acknowledge that there was uh, valid samples on those for for uh, Tylee or for uh, Tylee on those samples. Is that correct? That's correct. But is but isn't it true, Dr. Hampinke? There is no accurate way to determine actually how those samples got on those tools is there not by anything that i can do with dna no. uh, okay thank you doctor yep judge i have nothing else okay that will conclude the testimony of the witness then is he going to remain under subpoena by either the state or the defense mr Pryor? judge he's yeah, judge. me first uh, judge he's going to be excused we don't have him under subpoena Okay, that'll conclude your testimony. Thank you for appearing and testifying today. You can step down.